Holy Spirit, again, we ask that you would be here. Uh, I ask that you would uh, speak through me to your people. Um, that you would open up our eyes, that we would have a revelation of your heart towards us. And Lord, that you'd continue to move here and among us and strengthen and build deep what you're doing here. That the foundation would be laid deep, Lord, so that you could build a mighty structure here amongst us that will support many, many people in the years to come and in the future so many lives would be changed and hearts would be transformed. Lord, let your presence be here for change and for healing and for restoration. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 All right. If your Bibles turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, we're going to read part of that and then go into chapter 3. Lots of scripture to read this morning, um, so be patient. It's, um, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing um, in North America, the way we have structured our messages and our sermons. Um, I hear more and more churches um, advertising and using it as a marketing ploy to get you to come to church that we do church in under an hour. Um, sermons no more than 20 minutes. And I can't imagine why I'd get up to go. <laughs> so um, it's just, it, it, if you really think you can deliver something powerful and life-changing in 20 minutes, I, I, uh, I beg to differ, because Jesus couldn't do it. Uh, Jesus stood for hours and hours and hours and taught people all day uh, and into the night. So, and Paul did the same thing. There's so much truth in God's Word, uh, and we live in a culture where we want everything in bite sizes and, and little pieces, and I don't think uh, you people are anything like that, but um, I always get scolded by other pastors when I tell them we preach for, you know, 45, 50 minutes, um, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, and and I was, a couple messages an hour, three minutes. I apologize for those. Those are a bit long. Um, <laughs> but I believe in order to really build a case for truth and what we're trying to teach, I look at most of you as leaders in the coming church. Uh, I don't think we, we have a, a congregation of people that I'm trying to preach to the lowest common denominator. I'm trying to preach to the highest common denominator and make everybody else catch up. Um, I think it's healthy for all of you because it causes you to be hungry and to grow and to run to keep up, and I think that's good. Otherwise, what happens is over time you lo lose all your mature believers because I can do a sermon this morning on, uh, you know, how many of you are wearing masks and you're not being real and... Here's three points on how to not wear your mask anymore, and I've got a great, slick PowerPoint presentation uh, to show you that. Uh, I think for the gospel of Jesus Christ, all you really need is a Bible and a heart full of the Spirit, and you can deliver powerful words that will transform people. We've leaned as the modern church in Canada and the United States on our slick presentations, and they're, they're all puff and no content, right? A, a, a lot of big bang and no material inside. And so this is why we read a lot of scripture here. I encourage you to re bring your Bibles, uh, take notes if you like. Um, so that you can follow along. What I want to show you this morning is uh, from Ephesians that God had a mystery and a plan that he was working on for a long time, that he's been working on for thousands and thousands of years, and we are the result of that plan being actuated, happening, and God has a plan into the future that he is calling us into. We live in an incredibly pivotal time in the church. I know I've used the words many times. We're called uh, the Refuge Revolution Church. I believe that this is going to become a marquee um, statement in the future, and churches will also attach to what we're doing and will attach to what they're doing, and they will also call themselves a revolutionary kind of church because we believe in a revolutionary message. I'm no longer comfortable with the concept of what I have come up to know in, in certain circles of Pentecostal and evangelical Christianity, I don't even believe it's Christianity anymore. And I'm hearing other Christian leaders that are teaching what we're teaching, saying the same kind of bold, radical things, that it's actually an entirely different religion that we're, we're talking about here. There's one religion that says it's not based on works, but faith alone. But yet, in all the messages that I hear coming out of that camp, it's actually not true. It is based on works. Because you hear stuff constantly about, are you sold out for Jesus? Have you totally committed yourself to Christ? You know, are you on fire for Jesus? You know, are you lukewarm? Are you currently in a backsliding condition? Check yourself. Check yourself. 
check yourself, right? Heard those messages? Um, <laughs> see if you slow it down, it feels like the Holy Spirit. Um, so I, I've heard lots of those. I've grown up under lots of those. I continue to hear those messages. Do more. Try harder. You know, is God number one in your life? What would Jesus do? You know, all these catchphrases that I am still trying to get out of my vocabulary. I'm not totally successful doing that, but I'm getting better. I still find myself that every time something goes wrong in my life, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. is God after me? Have I done something wrong? Oh, this must be. I, I, you, know, you know, I talked negatively to that person the other day, and this is just this is my retribution. It's the whole fear of the Lord thing. And I constantly still find myself having to stop myself going, no, no, remember what you preached the other week. <laughs> right? And I'm having to remind myself daily of God's goodness and his mercy. Now, what does that say of the fear of the Lord? Does it negate the fear of the Lord? Absolutely not. What I want to show you this morning is that because of God's grace and because it is so wonderful and majestic and has been afforded to us such a great thing that we had no commonwealth assurance of, that we had no promise of the blessing of God as Gentiles, we didn't have any hope. We were a people without hope. So the fear of the Lord is this, is that while he is great and mighty and stood righteous, and stood in justice to ignore us as a people, as Gentiles, having no part in his kingdom. And he was completely right and justified in doing so. He extended truly an olive branch to us, right? Even that term that we get is because Jesus is the olive branch. And God extended an olive branch to us because the Jews rejected it. The, the Jews rejected the, their Messiah. They rejected God. And so Jesus used this parable. He said, when the, the feast happens, when I throw this party, this, this marriage feast, and the, the guests and my friends whom I invited, they've all said, oh, we're busy. You know, Jesus writes uh, these words that he says, you know, some said, well, I just got married, so I won't be able to make it. Or I'm going to buy something. Sorry, I can't come. Oh, I had to work today. Sorry, I can't make it. I can't make it out for you, Lord. And because of that, the, the father is, is upset and so he goes and tells his servants, go into the streets and the highways and the byways and look for the poor and the destitute and look for them and invite them to come, right? So when there's that great of mercy, when there is that great of grace extended to us, let us not be a people that says, Lord, I'm too busy. Lord, I've got this and I've got that and I can't attend to your kingdom and I can't put it first because I've got other things I've got to be doing. Let us learn the lesson of Israel and not be like Israel. Let us come before the Lord and say, Lord, it's, it's all about you. You must be the cornerstone in my life because if you're not, things will just fall apart. If you think that your own goodness or your own deeds are going to sustain you long term, they won't. The house will fall. And often great is the fall, the Bible says. So you want to be a person that says, Lord, on you alone I build this. And so there is a sense of the fear of the Lord that such great grace was afforded to us. And let's be aware of that. Not for it to be condemning or to be heavy upon you but it should be ominous to you. It should be great to you and mighty to you that such great grace was afforded to us. And so we should learn the lesson of Israel and not take it lightly. Take not lightly the grace of God, right? That's what the fear of the Lord means, is to not take late, lightly God's grace. Um, so keep your uh, finger in Ephesians 2 there. And then if you want, turn to uh, Isaiah 59. I want you to tell you about our former state. If you go to Isaiah 59, verse 9. It says, Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold darkness. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. 
we stumble at midday and then twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. This is talking about all of us, the Gentile people. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. You hear that? We're going to refer to that. And righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the street and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. But now it changes. It says, now the Lord saw. So this is the cry of the Gentile people, but it says, now the Lord saw. And it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Now, where do we get this armor talk? In which book in the New Testament? In Ephesians, right? So I'm saying that Paul's on to something here. His head, Paul's head is stuck right here in Isaiah 59. He's getting his imagery from Isaiah 59 and onward into the 60s of Isaiah. The proof text is here that he's talking about a helmet of salvation. Ephesians talks about a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians tells us that there is a breastplate of righteousness. This is exactly where Paul, understanding the Old Testament, is pulling this passage from. And Paul's primary purpose was to preach to whom? The Gentiles. And that's how we know this passage is for the Gentiles because this is where he's getting his imagery from. Now the Lord saw. I want you to feel that. And the Lord saw. And it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. And again, I want to go back to this idea that we constantly portray God's justice in a negative light. I'm so tired of it. It's like I, I want to strangle the next person who says it like that to me in love and, and in gentleness. <laughs> but they go, yes, but what about God's justice? I'm like, I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. You're a scary person. And God's justice is always portrayed in this dark light. But God's justice looked down time and saw Gentiles with no hope and a people with no savior and no chance while his own people were rejecting him. And in the heart of God, he said, this is not just. This is not right. I'm going to give the Gentiles an opportunity to come to me too. And there was no one to intercede for them. No one to pray for them because Israel was supposed to be the intercessor for the Gentiles. It was always God's plan. But Israel wasn't interceding for the Gentiles. They were enslaving the Gentiles during this time. God, this is why God destroys them again and they go into captivity. Solomon was well known for his slave trading and arms dealing. We think of Solomon as a good guy, not such a good guy. 700 and some heathen wives that he took for himself when the Lord had given him wisdom and honor and riches above any other man ever on the earth. And he used that to oppress people rather than to liberate and save people. And the Lord wasn't happy because Israel was meant to be this intercessor and they were not. And this is even says, and this is why I love the idea of open sovereignty, because you can read a passage like this in Isaiah 60 or 59 and not struggle with it. Listen to these words and think of God in this light. And he saw that there was no man and was astonished 
that there was no one to intercede. Can you believe that God was astonished? But he was. And we've been told God can't be astonished. God can't be surprised. But clearly here in God's word, it says that he was astonished. He had expected somebody to rise up to intercede and there was nobody to intercede. And so his right arm rose up an intercessor that we have in Christ. He rose up a man to become the salvation. He himself decided, I will go and become the salvation to the Gentiles. I will be their righteousness. I will come as a man and pray and intercede for them on my own behalf. I'll make another like me. I'll put another form of me in mankind into Mary that she will be born or he will be born into this world, and he will rise up to be holy and perfect, and I will cause him to intercede for the Gentiles. This was God's heart all along. Now flip back to, uh, keep your finger there and flip back to Ephesians. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I'll just keep going. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now understand that word wrath doesn't mean God's wrath. We were children of our own wrath. The word there in the Greek means anger. We're children of passionate anger. We get angry about things, so we want judgment and vengeance. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. So why is this important for us to see this? He's, I want you to see that the group that Paul's talking to, he's talking to the church and potential listeners by saying that you were a people that used to walk this way. But so often, pastors use this passage to say, see, church, you shouldn't be living this way. This is the way you used to live, and if you continue to live this way, it is sin, and it is wrong, and it will estrange you from God, because your sin blocks you from knowing God. How many of you have heard a message similar to that? Okay. Your, your sin will block you from God. No. No, 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 no. 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 No, 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 that's no, that's not what it's saying, okay? You only have to read a little bit and have a little understanding of the Old Testament, just a little wee bit to understand that that's a huge no, that is not what this is saying. He's saying that while you were yet sinners, Christ died. While you yet didn't know God, his grace came. He already knows the sinners are sinners. He's fully aware. He's all-knowing. And he's all-powerful. And an all-powerful judge, with full of justice and the ability to terminate the human race, as he did in the days of Noah, but promised he would never do it again, said, I'm not destroying anymore. I'm now in the business of saving I'm now in the business of reconciling. The church's business is not to preach against sin. I get told that. You don't preach enough against sin. I go, you don't preach at all. You're not preaching at all. You preach death instead of life when you preach sin. Because law gave power to sin. So when you preach law, you preach death. And too many Christians are sitting in churches all over our nation hearing a message of death and damnation and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is time for us as Christians to go to war over this message. Can I get a clap? We need to go to war over this message. There are too many Bible schools and too many churches and denominations that do not raise the banner of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but raise the banner of self-righteousness, self-abasement, self-holiness. And this is not the gospel of Jesus. And they have had their day and they have had their time and they have shown themselves weak and failing and fainting and have not the power of God behind their words. 
Their messages are empty and they are deaf and they are filling graves uh, called churches where people sit week after week and listen to death and dying and messages without hope and without life and they raise their noses up against the giftings and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for the way of the mind and the education of the soul and not the invigoration and the incarceration of the Holy Spirit inside a man to entrap him and to work in him righteousness. This is the kind of preaching that the Holy Spirit has longed for. And I don't say it of my own accord, but when I go and pray in the Spirit, I was praying the Spirit this morning and weeping and weeping before the Lord as I feel Him compressing a message in my soul, like tight springs being pressed down. I said, Lord, press in as much as you can press in this morning without killing me. And this is the result of this. This is the message God wants his people to hear. It's Christ alone, my cornerstone. My hope is in his righteousness alone. Not this weak frame. Not this simple, sweet little frame that can't endure anything. But he endured everything on our behalf. And it was all his plan all along. So do we look loosely on sin? Do we encourage sin? No. But you know what? There are times I do. Somebody goes, well, I I just want to keep sinning. I go, then keep sinning. Keep sinning and find its end. Keep sinning and find its death. Eat of its fruit. Taste of its death in your life. If you want destruction in your life, partake of it till its end. And then when you're desperate, and then when you need Jesus, because you've drank yourself to the bottom of the last bottle, and you've taken the last narcotic, and you've slept with as many people as you can, and you find yourself full of brokenness and disease, and your liver rotting, then cry out to the mercy of Jesus so he'll come and rescue you. He's not scared of you sinning. He's scared of you never knowing his grace. That's what he's frightened of. Not that you would sin. You're already sinners being made righteous and being made holy. I don't preach against sin. I preach for the grace and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. It does you no good for me to tell the sinner not to sin when it's in your heart to sin. God knows it's in your heart. He's trying to reconcile you so that your heart changes and the desires change because it's easy to not sin when you don't want to. It's easy to sin when you desires of change and you just say, Jesus, oh, for Jesus, that I might know his glory, that I might receive his Holy Spirit because you know what? Being holy feels awesome. Being righteous feels liberating and peaceful. Sin has a destructive nature to us. Just reading a, a, a piece from a book today, and they've done a whole study, spent thousands of hours researching this. And they have found that people who have multiple sex partners over and over again, it absolutely shuts your brain down with the ability to produce the things that your body needs to stay not depressed. It suppresses those hormones in your body. They don't know why, it just does. And you know why it does? Because you feel condemned. Because you feel guilty. And your guilt and condemnation oppresses you and it suppresses the brain's ability to produce serotonin to make you happy. God wants us to be free. There's reasons that he's laid out things a certain way because he doesn't want you to feel condemned. You know the only reason you don't feel guilty and condemned when you have sex inside of a marriage? Not because there's any magic. These aren't magic rings. They aren't from the Chronicles of Narnia, right? They're man-made out of gold. But somehow God has orchestrated it that he has said it's okay in this environment. And so we know that when we put that ring on, we're, we're good. We're okay. And it's that knowing that it is safe. It is that knowing that you're you're not in trouble. The knowing that there's no condemnation for it frees you. It liberates you so that you can enjoy it inside that context. And that's why preaching against it as sinful and evil and you better stop or God's coming after you is useless and pointless. 
God's going, I just have something way better. I have something way better for you that is more liberating and more freeing, and you'll enjoy it way more. Yeah, you agree? That's <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Do you notice here between verse and 5 that there isn't the insert of the sinner's prayer? Do you notice that we didn't have to do anything to receive this grace? You know why I know we didn't have to do anything? Because it's pretty clear that it says in verse 1, and you were dead. Dead people have tough times earning stuff. If you want to prove that out, start a business and hire only dead people and see how it goes. It doesn't work out very well. You need living people. But God, for his business enterprise, the master entrepreneur of the universe, said, I'm going to do something radically different. I'm going to start my movement with dead people. And everybody thought it was a bad idea, including the Pharisees. He picked dead people to start his ministry with. But what the devil didn't know is that the resurrection and the life was bringing forth life to those who were dead. And man, that starts a movement. Imagine starting a medical clinic where all your patients are dead. You just get them to bring in a bunch of corpses. All the doctors are going, I, I don't know. How are you going to practice medicine on dead people? And you go, well, just wait and see. And you start speaking life over those dead people. And one day, they all wake up. And one day, they all walk out healed and healthy, completely whole. All healed from the diseases that killed them. Well, now just not those doctors are interested. But now the whole world is coming to that clinic to figure out, what are you doing? You raise dead people to life. And this has been the thing that the church has forgotten about. We think we're an institution where you come every Sunday morning to get a moral boost. We're, we're effectively Red Bull. <laughs> you know? And I would say most churches, it's not even as good as Red Bull. It would be like a lukewarm Coke. But God's not interested in being us a, a church where we just get a shot of energy, right? And it's a high, and then you crash, and you need another Red Bull right after that. So you just get addicted to Red Bull. And it's why most people are attending church, because they're just addicted to getting that little bit of boost, because there's really no boost at all. I want to train you guys up so you can be sent out into your world and affect change there. Even when we were dead even when we were dead, when we were dead in our, trust, in our transgressions, he made us alive. So there was something that God found willing to do. He made us alive though we were dead. We were unable to respond, but he responded to us. We were unable to love back. That's why scripture says he first loved us so that we could love him. And he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And I'm telling you, we're living in that age to come. This is the age that God has been waiting for to come. And it has now come, and you are a people that are living in this age and hearing the message that the Spirit has wanted to preach for a long time. There's been a lot of wars. There's been a lot of religious fighting. There's been Christians, and both, both the Catholics and the Calvinists were doing the same thing. If you didn't agree with them, they just executed you. They just had you killed. But the days have changed to separate church from state. That is a good thing and a godly thing because it has allowed the message of grace to finally begin to surface because they can't burn us at the stake anymore because their desire was just like the desires of the Pharisees to control and manipulate the people to extract money out of them that has always been the purpose of mankind and it has always been the purpose of religion it is the same in buddhism it is the same in islam it is the same in christianity it is to manipulate and control people to extract money from them 
but the gospel of Jesus is more. It is not for the purpose of extraction. It is the purpose, actually it is. It is the purpose of extraction. We want to extract people out of their death. We want to extract people out of their problems, extract people out of their pain, their suffering and their brokenness, and give them life. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. And it is doubly so for you as a Gentile. You are without hope, without promise. For we are the, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentile, in the flesh, were called the uncircumcision, and, so, and the so-called circumcision which performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. For he himself is our peace. Do you see the, the, the difference or do you see the similarity between this and Isaiah 59? We were without hope. And then it transfers from verse 12 to 13. We didn't have hope. We were without God in the world. But then God sends a redeemer. God sends one to save us, as we know from Isaiah 59. And then it says, but now in Christ, this righteousness that he sent, whom formerly were far off, now, do you hear what it says? You who were formerly far off. Let's go back to Isaiah 59. In verse 14, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. You see, we were far off from righteousness, far away from it. But now in Christ Jesus, whom formerly, whom you formerly were far off, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, Jews and Gentiles, into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace." And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Okay, so verse 17, you'll see that it's capitalized if you're looking in your Bible. And he's referring back again to Isaiah 59. That's where that passage is coming from. For through him we have one body, our access into one spirit of the Father so that you no longer are strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fit together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together in dwelling of God in the Spirit." This has been the goal of the Lord, is to build a new tabernacle on the earth. Jesus said, not one made by the hands of man, but one made by the Spirit of God. And we are each stones, we are small stones, Jesus being the cornerstone in this great temple that God is building. Okay? And this is the time that we're living in, that God is getting ready to complete this temple. Right? I think he's about ready to put the roof on the thing. Right? The walls have been built. The structure is there. The foundation has been laid. And God is getting ready to do a great thing. And in order to lay that roof, he's going to need a myriad of stones. A myriad of stones for that purpose. And I believe we're on the edge of a great awakening in our culture. And the Spirit of God's going to pour out. Many, many people are going to come to the Lord. Okay, go back to Isaiah 60. I want you to see what changes here. So he's astonished because there's no man. He puts on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. 
I'll tell you what, when the Lord decides he's going to put on a helmet of salvation, he intends to use it. The Lord put on a helmet of salvation for a purpose because all that was in the mind of God was to save the race of mankind. That was all that was in God's mind. He put it as his helmet. I believe it probably says it on, on there, salvation. That is exactly what God set out to do, was to save mankind. And according to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the coastlands he will make recompense, so they will fear the name of the Lord from the west. Isn't that interesting? He's talking about the judgment he would break, bring against Israel. And he says, so the reason is so that they would fear the name of the Lord from the west. Hey, where are we from? We're from the west, right? And his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And we'll pick this up when we do our series in Revelation. This rushing stream, this water that's coming. We see it in the book of Revelation as well. So God has poured out this river of living water. He came rushing to us. It's the same statement Jesus uses from the, the parable of the prodigal son that he says, and the father seeing his son in the distance ran to him. He ran to him. The Lord rushes to you. The Bible says he hears the cry of a poor man and he answers him. You see, God wants to elevate your minds about your situation. He wants to elevate your minds about who you are. God just didn't come to save the world and save people so that you can go, oh, yay, I'm saved. I guess I'll go home now and read a book. God didn't save you so that you would just be saved. He saved you and brought his Holy Spirit to you so that you could be transformed, that you could be changed from the inside out so that you may know peace and that you may know joy and that you may know that all found in him. Because as he changes you, your life is liberated. You become full of peace, full of confidence, full of liberty. And then he has done that so that you would go into the world and do the same as his ambassadors. A redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgressions in Jacob declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. So this is a message back then and forever. Now this is what happens as a result of that. I want you to know that this applies to you. Now, I'm not going to have time to read all four chapters or six chapters, but when you get home and through this week, I challenge you to read Isaiah 60 through 65. We're going to be spending some time there in the next few weeks, and I want you to say, see that this is all the Lord's saying to the Gentile people, which includes you. This is God's purpose, and it's his mystery that he has held back and wanted to release to the Gentiles. Arise! He says, and shine. So take this as speaking to you. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They gather together. They come to you and your sons from afar off. Your daughters will be carried in the arms. And then you will see and be radiant. And your heart will thrill and rejoice. Because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you. And then it goes on. Um, the flocks of Kedar will gather together to you. The rams will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. Who are these like a cloud and these like a dove to their lattices? Surely the coastlands will wait for me. Now hear what it says. And the ships of Tarshish will come first. This is, the, this is where Paul came from, right? With the gospel to the Gentiles, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, some of you sit here and say, God's going to bring the nations to me. God's going to bring peoples to me. He's going to raise me up and, and glorify me. And that thought is exactly the problem. 
That thought is exactly the problem. Because if we consistently have heard in the church a message about your sin and your condemnation and how unworthy you are and you better be grateful and you better do better, then your life is spent trying to do better, constantly failing, falling short of doing better, realizing you're not holy, realizing you're not perfect. And anybody who's lived that way for a long enough time, how many of you found out you couldn't do it? How many of you found out you just weren't holy and you kind of gave up? Trent's doing this. You know, for any of us who've done it for any amount of time and tried the way of holiness, it didn't work out so well. And so how can it not but lead to guilt and shame, embarrassment? I deal with so many Christians, they're just like, oh man, the Lord must be so disappointed with me. I've really let God down. How many of you verbalized, I've really let God down? I, I keep getting you to raise your hand. It, really, raise them high. I want everybody to look around. Okay, so the devil can't tell you you're the only one. We've all verbalized and been told that we've let God down. You cannot let God down. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. He picked you that way. He picked you at your worst state. So if he didn't let you down when he chose you, how can you let, be let down now? When you're here, you're here this morning to learn more about your father, right? You're here this morning to worship the father. Now, I know some of you are just here to give, but a lot of you are here. <laughs> A lot of you are here to learn about the Lord, to come and worship him and fellowship with his saints. And some of you are even here to give this morning to each other encouragement, building one another up. How pleased can the Lord be when we used to be a Gentile people that worshiped idols, that sacrificed our firstborn children in blood and drank the blood in worship to demon gods and then would have mass orgies in front of these idols. This, you, this is our heritage these were our people. How far have we come from those days to these days? God is pleased, let me tell you this morning. God is pleased with you. Lift your mind higher. Lift your mind higher to what you could be in Christ. When you spend time praying in the Spirit, worshiping the Lord outside of Sunday... In your private time, you shut everything off. You go in the basement, you go in your room, you put on your iPod and you listen to some worship music and you begin to walk around praying for people and praying the Spirit. God will listen to your prayers and He will answer them because you are an ambassador and you're saying, God, let your kingdom come here. And as an ambassador, I stake my flag in the ground and I want your kingdom to come here in this place. But we haven't believed it, church. We haven't believed it because we've been told a lie. We've been fed a lie for so long. And your parents were fed lies and their parents were fed lies. So we have devoted our time full time to trying to be holy and trying to be righteous. And so the enemy has defeated the church primarily in our culture because we're all trying to do what Jesus did. We're all trying to do what Jesus has already done. Instead of standing before the Lord saying, Lord, I come to you in thanksgiving and praise because you have already done all of it. I was praying for a boy this week uh, that Patrick and Abby know very well. It's a pastor, and, and I ask you all to be praying um, in, in Abbotsford. Uh, their son, who's 14 years old, has got bone cancer, and he is dying. And um, I had the opportunity to pray with him over the phone this week. And while I was in the high pitch of prayer and his dad was amening and shouting, I said, Lord, his name's Kim and his wife's name's Darlene. I said, Lord, not Kim and Darlene, not Matthew Klein and Patrick, and not all the people we know have enough faith to remove bone cancer. But Jesus, you do. You have enough faith. You can speak to that cancer and tell it to be removed. You can push it back. I don't know how to push back cancer cells, but you know how to push back cancer cells. It's because before I would go, well, I'm not prepared to pray for somebody with bone cancer. I mean, like, I need to pray and fast for a month. And then I'll get revved up. I'll get my righteousness on, right? I got some righteousness on from all my fasting and praying, and then I'm going to feel the anointing and the pie. We used to sing that in church. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood. 
We'd sing it for an hour. <laughs> All ladies would have their handkerchiefs out. If you haven't experienced that kind of church, it's a pretty good church. And so we'd all get revved up in the ghost, revved up, feeling righteous, and then pray and nothing would happen. And we'd go, ooh, we didn't pray long enough, hard enough. We weren't righteous enough. You see, and what God's looking for is something way simpler, compassion. Jesus healed people because he had compassion on them. And so when I go to pray for Jordan, this boy, I said, Lord, give me compassion. This morning I'm weeping as if it's my son. Now, where does that come from? Not me, because I'm such a good, wonderful guy. No, that comes because I go, Lord, I empty myself of my desires. And Lord, let me intercede for this boy and feel as the family feels. And then I was able to pray with compassion and conviction and pound the wall and say, no, Lord, no, no. You won't take this boy, no, for the sake of your kingdom and the cross and the message of grace because it's bigger than this family. It's bigger than me and it's bigger than this boy. It's bigger than cancer. God doesn't just want us to pray when someone gets cancer. He wants us to start to pray, church, that cancer be removed from our planet. It's not just praying when it's an emergency. It's praying that our world changes. And God continues to allow these to wake us up so that we start praying deeper, bigger, more escaping prayers that will change the face of our planet. Not praying for my individual needs because of poor me. You want answers to your prayer? Start praying for someone else. You want to see victory in your life? Pray for victory for someone else. Because the Bible says that there is no love greater than this, than someone who's willing to lay their life down on behalf of someone else. This is great love. This is perfect religion. And if we would learn as a people to live and breathe that way, it's pretty hard to be condemning, rebuking, and judging other people when you're spending time weeping on your knees for those same people. You, somebody really annoys you, start praying for them. They won't annoy you anymore because God will reveal to you by his Holy Spirit why they annoy you and what their deep struggle is that you know nothing about. See, our hope has got to be bigger. Our plan has got to be greater than just praying for our little individual needs. That's why if any of you have walked with the Lord for any length of time, it should absolutely annoy the tarnations out of you to sit in little prayer groups when we go around the circle and we call it popcorn prayer and we're just like, okay, everybody says a need. Well, I have an unspoken need. Well, me too. And, uh, you know, I was praying for my Aunt Betty because she's struggling this week. I don't want to get into it with everybody because it's kind of private. And then we go around and then we do all this little, little wimpy, flimsy praying, Lord, help Betty with her unspoken and, and Father... Lord, Father, we pray, Father, in the Father's name of Father, you know, and bless this. And, and we wonder why prayer isn't encouraging or exciting or transformational. Because there's no feeling, there's no heart, there's no compassion about it, because we could care less. That's why. We don't care. But all of a sudden, then someone gets cancer, and then, then we care. Because it's your mom, or your son, or your daughter, or your aunt, or your uncle, or your father, and then it's important, and then it means something. But then it's too late. It's not that God can't, but it's that then we're trying to believe in God and stir it up, and it's kind of too late. Because we haven't believed for God anything before that. <laughs> I'll share one story, and then I'll be done. It's kind of funny, but... So my son... Uh, some of you know who come over for Bible stuff, we have a nice big TV downstairs that we got out of, out of Boxing Day special for like 900 bucks. We were able to put it on the brick card. It was a smoking deal. And my son one day in his anger playing his video game had a penny and he chucked the penny at the screen and cracked it. And if you know anything about plasmas, once you crack it, it's over. You throw it in the trash. You, it can't be repaired because it actually, to replace that TV, to repair it was going to be about $1,500 to repair it. So you might as well get a new one. Anyway, so that was a few, you know, a couple months ago, a month and a half ago. And that was on Sunday morning, I found out. I went down to pray to get ready for the service. And I go to put on my worship music and there's a big crack in my, you know, eight-month-old TV. <laughs> 
I'm like, it's early, early in the morning, but I need to find out who did this. So I, I wake up all my kids. I'm like, who broke my TV? The two younger ones, and Ethan did it. I'm like, all right. So I walk into his room. Did you break it? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. I'm like, okay. You're going to get a job. And you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and like, I'm not happy, right? Now, I was amazingly under control because normally I'd have lost a gasket, you know. But I thought, you know, I, I still have to get ready for church. And I go up downstairs, and I'm really upset, and I'm trying to work past it because I've got to preach a message. And I told him, I said, I have to preach in like two hours, and now I'm like so upset about this, I don't know what to do. And now I've got to work through this. And so, anyways, I wasn't happy. So I told him all the things he was going to have to do to make up for it. So that night, about 3 in the morning, the Lord wakes me up. And he goes, do you remember when you were about 21, and you borrowed your dad's car, and you took it out because you were going on a date, and you weren't thinking straight, and you pull up and get gas, and you pull out the wrong nozzle and fill your dad's car full of diesel fuel. <laughs> and then knowing nothing about cars and being a complete imbecile, I just started it, and it was like boom, 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 boom black smoke coming out, so I just kept revving it. Ah! Ah! Hoping to get it out, you know, whatever that problem was, I thought revving would be the best solution. And so I drove that vehicle from Bowness, where I filled up all the way to McLeod Trail, um, just putting along, boom, boom, black smoke coming out the back. What's going on? It's my dad's crappy car. Oh. <laughs> So I pull off, and, and we, I, I meet this girl for a date, and, and uh, her dad knows lots about cars, so she says, pop the hood, let me take a look at it. So I'm like, it's kind of embarrassing, but <laughs> my date's going to fix my car. So uh, I pop the hood, and she's <clears throat> tinkering around under the hood, and she goes, okay, give it some gas. So I, vroom, and I just hear, boom, and black smoke <laughs> on either side, and she walked around and <laughs> so I'd ask my dad to come get me with my date and she had to go clean herself up so that was embarrassing and my dad then took the car to the mechanic and they couldn't figure out what was wrong they took out the transmission and completely disassembled the entire transmission and had it laid all over the ground and didn't know and finally a senior mechanic came in and touched it and was like, like, that's your problem. Someone put diesel in this. Now, I don't know what it costs to take apart a whole transmission, but I know it's not $49.95. <laughs> and you know what? The Lord said, do you remember when you did that? I said, yeah. And he goes, and did your dad make you get a job? I said, no. I said, what did he do? He had grace and he had mercy and he never brought it up again. He just paid for it. <sighs> I said, okay, Lord. So I went and I told my son, I said, the Lord woke me up, and I'm just, I'm just going to extend grace and mercy. You don't have to worry about it. So he just melted. He was like, oh, I was so worried I was going to pay for this. You know? I said, it's okay. But what I want you to do is pray that mom and dad find a good deal. I want you to pray about that. He said, okay, okay. So being a teenager, he forgot and forgot. Victoria, meanwhile, had been looking for a TV to replace it because ladies' Bible study needs it. I use it in the war room. And we're like, oh, Lord, I don't want to spend a bunch of money on this again, and I don't know what I'm going to do. So we'd gone to the brick day after day looking for a TV that we liked, and they didn't have it. And they had it. It was too much money. It's like $2,000. I'm like, I don't want to spend that. So anyways, we're looking around. and So then a few days ago, this was, so you know it's Black Friday, and they're going to have big sales. We went Thursday, nothing. So Ethan tells me Thursday night, he goes, Dad, he goes, uh, I, I prayed what you told me to pray. I prayed that, you, I said, because, son, I want you to see God's grace. I want you to see how his grace even covers our mistakes and works good out of them somehow. And I'm like, I have no idea how God's going to work good out of wrecking a perfectly good TV that I just chuck in the garbage. I don't know how that's going to be good, but somehow God will work it out for good. I said, I want you to pray that. So he came to me, I prayed that. So we went out on Friday and we drove up to the brick and I said, Lord, my son prayed that I need a deal today. I need it to be done today. I'm tired of looking for TVs. I don't have time for this and I want it to be done and I want to see a miracle. So we walk in, we look for the TV we like again. It's not on sale. And then I look and there's all these 60 inch TVs and they've marked them down for the sale for 1649, 1649, 1649. 
And then there's this giant box, a bigger, way bigger TV than these ones, and it has the same price, $16.49. I'm like, no, something's wrong. Because I look up, and the exact same TV's on display for $3,300. And this one's $16.49. I'm like, hey, I know there's a sale on, but nobody sells it for that good. So I kind of wrap my body around the box <laughs> and wave at a sales guy, you know, glaring at people walking by. And he comes over and I said, I want this TV. If this is the price, I want this TV. He goes, I don't know. I don't think that's the price. So he goes back to his computer and looks and he goes, no, our cost on that TV is like 2800 So uh, there's no way that can be the sale price. So he has to go get the sales manager who has to call head office. And the, and the sales manager comes up to me with his little gun, scans it, goes over to the computer and goes, this TV shouldn't even be in our store. It says we have zero of these. So I don't even know how it's in the store because we don't even have this TV in our SKU at all. So I have to like re-enter it in. And he goes, I'll tell you what, Merry Christmas. It's your lucky day. I'd go buy a lottery ticket because you just got a $3,300 TV for $1,600. He goes, somebody's going to be in serious trouble for this, right? Yeah. So, and then plus, plus the brick gave us a gift card because we'd wrecked our last TV. Plus they extended the warranty from the last TV. And so when all was said and done, I ended up paying the same amount for that TV as I did for my last one the same amount, and so it works this. If I'd have just walked in, okay, during a sale and bought that TV and got it for $2,000, which is what I actually had to spend out of pocket, between the first TV and that one, I still would have got that TV for a $1,300 off difference. And that's how God's grace can just cover over the mistake. So I was so excited to race home and tell Ethan, because I didn't care about the TV. What I cared about was that he got to see firsthand how God covered over his mistake and worked it out for good, you see? But we have to start expecting that of the Lord. I expected it when I drove up. I expect not to pay full price for things that are expensive. I expect not, because I expect that I want to give that money into the kingdom of God and not waste it on over-expensive TVs, okay? As the people of God, you shouldn't be paying retail for everything. You should believe in God for something better than that, okay? Very practical, simple, but start there. Start believing God for, like, parking spots. Start believing God for sales on things, because when you do that and you see God move on your behalf, when you start to say, Lord, I'm in debt, so instead of waiting to get out of debt, so I'm going to start giving, I'm going to give now and trust you that you'll take care of my debt, and you'll watch it, and there's several people here that will testify to that working, amen, so there's some of you here, and you will testify that giving gets you out of debt, not saving, because you'll always overspend and get yourself back in, so rely on God's goodness, and when you see God come through and pay off your debt, then you're going to start to trust him. And so then it amps up and it amps up. And so there'll come a day when you pray for someone who does can have cancer, you'll expect them to get healed because you'll expect that God's good and you'll expect that he'll answer you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness, your overall plan Lord, that is so magnificent that we're just starting to see the beginnings of it. And I know you're going to reveal more and release more as time goes on. But I pray that as a group, you would elevate our mind, that we would start to grab hold of the mind of Christ, that we would come boldly before your throne and ask you for things for the sake of your kingdom. Lord, that we would believe better about you and not so bad about ourselves, that we would believe better about us and better about you. And, Lord, that we would come to know your heart for your people. Bless these, your people, Lord. Raise their mind. Raise their understanding. Raise their continent, countenance to look to you where their help comes from, Jesus. And I pray that you would begin to remove oppressions, remove brokenness over them, remove anxiety. Lord, remove condemnation and guilt. Remove addiction, Lord. Remove fear. Lord, that there's somebody here this morning that's really struggling with fear, and the Lord wants 
you to know that he's going to break that over you very soon. This week is going to start to come apart, and the Lord's going to show you a root of that thing and be able to pull it out of your life. And somebody's really struggling with that, and the Lord says, it's okay. I am your guardian, and I am your shield. I am your right arm. I am your steadfast. I am your anchor in the storm. You have nothing to fear because I walk with you. I overshadow you. You are under my wing, and I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. I will always stand beside you. You have nothing to fear anymore. Stop believing the lies that have been spoken over you and start believing that I am with you. In Jesus' name, amen.